Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. I am very happy to see that we have somewhere in the region of 34, 35 participants, which is excellent. Um, Amy and I were talking about the problems very often of, of, of getting a, a critical mass um, in the field of uh, the studies of, of Georgia, Azerbaijan and, and Armenia. So um, this is, I guess, one of the silver linings of, of the pandemic that we can do this sort of thing. So welcome everybody. Um, I am Vice President of ARISC, um, but I'm not the organizer of these talks. I want to thank uh, Talin and, and Maureen for um, really putting the work into this and, and getting this off the ground. Um, uh, in this series that ARISC has, has put on, uh, we are highlighting the work of three early career postdoctoral scholars from the disciplines of geography, social science, and history, in addition to today's, to, to, to today's talk. Um, on April the 16th, we hosted Dr. Ariel Otruba, who's uh, in the Sociology and Anthropology Department at Moravia College, um, and her talk was entitled Borderization from the Frontlines, Uncertainty and Abandonment in the Space Between War and Peace. And then we had another talk on April the 20th, uh, Dr. Scott Demian, School of Environment and Natural Resources, um, the Ohio State University. And uh, his talk was entitled Infrared Spectroscopy, a tool for rapid land degradation assessment. And the reason we mention these is not only to tell you about the activities of ARISC, um, but also to recommend that you actually go to the ARISC website and you can look at recordings of both these talks. Um, I wasn't able to attend either, but I've looked at the recordings and they're definitely well worth watching. Um, we also have an upcoming session. Uh, it's called Alt Academic Professional Development Forum takes place on Friday, May the 7th at noon Eastern time, EST, Eastern Standard Time. Um, registration is required, uh, which you can do through the website uh, at ARISC, www.arisc.org. And again, something I would recommend, it looks like it's gonna be a really interesting panel with uh, people from very different uh, professions talking about how useful um, their, their, uh, their degrees um, in Caucasian studies were for the work that they're doing um, today. So now I have the great pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Amy Dobbs. I'm so delighted that she, she's agreed to, to do this talk. Uh, Dr. Dobbs is a sociocultural historian and she's currently ARISC's assistant director, which we're very pleased with. She holds a PhD in history from Indiana University and, and specialities in the fields of Russian and Ottoman history and Central Eurasian studies. She has an MA in Soviet history from the University of Toronto and a dual BA in Russian language and literature and history from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And always glad to see somebody specializing in literature, um, talking about political science and anthropology. Um, she is an Arisk graduate, postdoctoral fellow alumna, and also a former Fulbright scholar. Um, Dr. Dobbs' research examines how the local environment, institutions, and certain personalities shape the discourse, implementation, and reception of imperial education policies and general educational reform among South Caucasian Muslims between 1867 and 1905. Her study compares these trends to other Muslim areas of the Russian Empire while referencing similar transformations in the Ottoman and Persian empires. Dr. Dobbs' research focuses on capturing the diversity within the Russian Empire's Islamic world and underscores the importance of locality in shaping institutional systems and human interaction. Her most recent project involves an examination of Baku and Tbilisi from the years 1905 to 1914, focusing on how these years transformed the nature of the Azerbaijani Muslim reformist movement. Dr. Dobbs has taught history courses at public and private institutions. She has served as an administrator for the Central Eurasian Studies Society in years past. She enjoys her new position, so she tells me at ARISC, and looks forward to helping the Institute support the South Caucasian research and exchange in the future. So please join me in a round of virtual applause uh, for Dr. Dobbs. And um, uh, Amy, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Well, thank you to all of you for your attendance today and to Eris for giving me this opportunity to speak and to Steve and Johns for emceeing. 
Uh, the source of my talk today is my dissertation under the banner of Educational Reform, the Emergence of the Azerbaijani Reform Movement in Late Imperial Russia. Uh, the presentation is a brief summary of that larger work. Uh, my dissertation is a project that examines the emergence of a cultural reform movement among Azerbaijani Muslims who believed in the transformative power of education. These individuals advanced novel ideas about knowledge and supported educational reforms that they believed would open their com community to participation in the imperial domain. To trace the movement's beginnings, my study focused on five discursive and institutional spaces. Tbilisi as an imperial center, administrative discussions about non-Russian schooling, a discourse on education in the first Muslim newspapers, Muslim teacher training schools, and reformist activities in Baku. These spheres fundamentally changed sociocultural and intellectual ideas regarding the value and necessities of modern education while generating spaces for the manifestation of the movement itself. The Azerbaijani Muslim critical community was not merely a native response to colonialism, however. Rather, it was the product of an interwoven tapestry of local administrative strategies, state institutions, and Azerbaijani Muslim networks that centered on cultural reform during a transitional period that had destabilized older social constructions and patterns of cultural production. The study highlights the uniqueness of the South Caucasian experience by comparing it to other, other imperial regions with large Muslim populations to highlight the heterogeneity among Muslims in the Russian Empire. As a historian, I believe we must strive to depict the Muslim world's dynamic and heterogeneous, heter, heterogeneous reality as an evidential corrective to attitudes existing in the non-Muslim world that have considered them a stagnant and monolithic faith community. Social science, scientists in the last 40 years have turned their attention to the intersection between culture and human collectivities, primarily looking at the influence of social movements on cultural transformation. Scholars have moved beyond analyzing individual movements to examining cultural environments. Through this lens, they have been able to examine the wider characteristics of cultural change. For instance, how a culture moves in a society or how resources can channel or constrain social movements. To examine cultural change, political scientist Thomas Racon pointed to critical communities. He defined them as relatively small groups of critical thinkers who developed a sensitivity to, to some problem, an analysis of its sources, and a prescription for what should be done. The critical community's critique of established norms form a discourse that generates new value perspectives while mean manifesting a degree of social uncertainty. As the critical community coalesces around the issue, they often mobilize into a social movement, disseminating their community's message through public discourse. The inevitable clash between their perspectives and conventional norms sparks public debate. And as the community becomes more organized and skilled, it often takes the form of a more active social movement that moves to make structural changes in support of their perspectives. Racon's study about the origins of cultural change, the stages of collective action, and the environment that social movements operate in serves as, as a theoretical framework for examining, examining the incipient group of Azerbaijani Muslims centered around educational reform in the South Caucasus in the 19th century. This presentation examines the Azerbaijani experience of colonial governance and the discursive spaces surrounding educational reform, its implementation, and the newly emerging political rationalities and identity politics that materialized mainly in urban centers in the mid to late 19th century. The 1860s and 70s in the Russian Empire were decades of rapid reform. Born out of Russia's devastating defeat in the Crimean War, Alexander II's great reforms initiated a modernization campaign that aimed to move the empire towards what towards a somewhat more liberalized, technologically advanced and capitalist order. Central to the state's modernization campaign was mass literacy. To achieve the same, the state implemented a strategy for comprehensive schooling. The great reforms were not, however, implemented evenly throughout the empire and the degree of impact was largely dependent on local conditions. For instance, in the vice royality of the Caucasus, uh, which it makes up the North and South Caucasus, um, some reforms were never implemented, while others were partially, partially implemented. 
Emancipation of the serfs, for instance, came in 1870. Uh, however, since serfdom was never formalized among the Muslim population, the reforms only affected a fraction of the Muslim peasantry. In the South Caucasus case, the great reforms were be belated, partial, and often unsuited to local norms. This did not mean, however, that this era of change did not have a remarkable impact on the region. It did. While colonial governance in the South Caucasus had been defined by confessional politics, resource insufficiencies, and geopolitical considerations from its inception in 1844, after the Cauc Caucasian Wars end in 1864 and the implementation of the great reforms in Russia, it began to involve the bureaucratization of non-Russian authorities and the scrutinization of, uh, of allied institutions. The South Caucasian ulema began to receive state salaries, exemptions and taxes and corporal punishment, and in some cases, allocations of rank. Simultaneously, state administrators began to keep a watchful eye over Muslim institutions. For instance, in schooling, they attempted to assess, register and monitor Muslim establishments of learning. However, this was difficult, as at the time, South Caucasian educational institutions resembled other areas of the Muslim world and had neither centralized authority nor were they restricted at the primary level to any particular venue. Learning may occur in a mektab house in a mosque or it may occur in a local store, craftsman's shop or mola's home. The informality of the educational setting made it possible for Russian authorities to act, made it impossible for Russian authorities to accurately calculate the number of Muslim primary education sites. And like most religious education, 19th century South Caucasian Muslim schooling was to instill moral, ethical, and spiritual values among pupils and impart necessarily knowledge to navigate life within a Muslim community. In terms of educational aims, South Caucasian Muslims were not re remarkably different from their Orthodox Christian counterparts. Yet for Russian state administrators, questions emerged about the usability of a schooling network centered on a belief system completely untethered to Orthodoxy, czar, and country. In effect, the Muslim school stood outside unificatory aims. For 1860s administrators, the existing network of Islamic schools in the South Caucasus was enigmatic and problematic. From the 1840s, Russian administrators opened a greater number of official posts to the military and civil service, in the military and civil service to local non-Russian elites. For South Caucasian Muslims, the positions were limited, but for those holding posts, they were significant. Imperial schools such as Tiflis's Gymnasia afforded their youth an expanded curriculum, access to elite networks and exposure to a different worldview. At the same time, some members of the re re Muslim religious establishment began to reassess religious schooling, considering the merits of reorganization and additional subjects, most notably Russian language. The result of these incremental, though barely noticeable transitions was the emergence of small cadres of local non-Russian elites who began to participate in imperial society and who strove to develop and promote their own languages and cultures on par with the language and culture being introduced by the Russian administration. These critical communities coalesced around educational reform at a time when the Russian state moved to implement empire-wide mass schooling. The undertaking of popular schooling was no simple task for the world's largest contiguous empire. The Tsar's subjects comprised millions of the other, non-Orthodox Christians in the South and East, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, animists, and pagans were suddenly uh, united in administrative discussions on, on education under the title Inerotsi. They stretched from the empire's Southwestern European borders east to the Pacific Ocean, and from the northern tundra to its southern borders with the Qing, Afghan tribes, and Persia's Qajar dynasty. They varied from those with their own writing systems and literary traditions to those re reliant upon orality. And they ranged from those living a sedentary lifestyle to those living a nomadic one. In short, the task of establishing a non-Russian schooling statute that aimed to serve all groups was nothing less than monumental. The 1864 statute that followed sanctioned schooling opportunities for all subjects. However, it made references, just two references to non-Orthodox, non-Russian peoples. School would be open to children regardless of a state, religious confession, and ethnicity, and all instruction was to be in Russian. As the state's direction, uh, as the statute's direction for non-Russians was ambiguous, 
the Minister of Education, D.A. Tolstoy, called for the creation of special commissions in Kazan and Simferopol to investigate non-Russian education in 1867. Muslims were a particular challenge since their communities often had wide networks of confessional schools already serving them. So the question for state administrators was threefold. How to educate Muslims in a Russian state system? How to incorporate or supersede the system that existed? And how to persuade parents to send their children to state schools? The political rationalities of the colonial project varied across Russia. In the three school districts with large Muslim populations, Kazan, Odessa, and the Caucasus, historical, environmental, and geopolitical factors shaped how local education administrators approached these questions. While Kazan administrators focused on using education to uphold and hopefully spread orthodoxy, Crimean administrators considered it a means to stave off Crimean Tatars' immigration and to incorporate their community into the greater imperial ecosystem. For the Caucasus, incorporation was a main concern, but so too was navigating the region's widespread and remarkably entangled heterogeneity and bonds, particularly among Armenians and Azerbaijani Muslims, to religious communities and educational institutions abroad. The resulting imperial statute on non-Russian schooling in 1870 underscored difference. It provided rubrics for education based on religion, native language, and levels of Russian language knowledge. Given that the discussion on non-Russian education began among administrators in the empire's first multi-confessional, multi-ethnic area of conquest, the Volga Kama region, the statute was largely structured on the Kazan school district's realities and perceived needs. Apostasy to Islam among Christian loomed large as a concern among Volga Kama administrators, and they perceived schooling as a lever to secure the Orthodox flock. Orthodoxy, native language, and when possible, homogenous classrooms were cornerstones of the non-Russian schooling statute. When considering the South, Cauc the South Caucasus interwoven ethnicities and the existence of a patchwork of schools under various state and private authorities, the non-Russian schooling statute provide impossible to implement. Rather than using native language as a segue to Russian, the ethnically diverse schools of the Caucasian school district relied upon Russian as an instructional language right from the start. The region's three main languages, Armenian, Azerbaijani, and Georgian, and their respective religions were uh, separate course subjects. CSD schools serve students together despite ethnic, religious, and linguistic difference. As the local school trustee remarked, if in Kazan it appears necessary for the overall objective of the school to bring together the purely academic with the missionary with a view towards Christi Christianity's fortification among non-Russians, in the Caucasus, such a, such a combination of aims is positively impossible. Here, the local government opens schools for all tribes and faiths. A missionary direction, direction cannot be permitted in them. As opposed to the Ministry of Education's approach, the Caucasian school district adopted a super religious approach and focused on establishing the well-ordered school, uh, which was founded on pedagogical principles. The South Caucasus environment prompted the district trustee to focus on Russian language learning and native languages, religions as subjects of study set upon pedagogical foundations. The character of CSD schools provided three, the three main local ethnicities children with the prospect of learning Russian, thus empowering them to access wider networks and their native language and religion, fostering their respective communities' general sociocultural development. The state's popular schooling initiative required the establishment of non-Russian teacher training schools. In 1872, laws establishing them resulted in two schools for Muslims in Ufa and Simferopol. These institutions were followed by three others in Kazan, Gori, and Orsk. The aim of these facilities was to train Muslim teachers for Tatar primary schools uh, who would be responsible for cultivating Muslim children's Russian language and subject knowledge as a method to inspire rapprochement between Muslim communities and the Russian state and the Russian population. The Tatar department at the Transcaucasian Teachers Seminary in Gori, in Gori, Georgia was distinct compared to its Simferopol and Kazan equivalents. Far away from any Muslim center, its Muslim students experienced student life on an ethno-religiously mixed campus that included Russian, Georgians, Armenians, and Muslims from the North and South Caucasus. 
While the seminary opened to Christian students in 1876, the Tatar department opened in 18, 1879. Enrollment varied widely over the first five years in the Tatar department. However, matriculant numbers lever, leveled out to approximately 10 incoming students per year until 1900. The school was initially directed by two progressive long experienced pedagogues, seminary director Didi Semyonov and Tatar department inspector A.O. Chernayevsky. The department's curriculum adhered to the 1872 statute, but most subject courses also had a methods component, so students learned, learned subjects as well as how to teach them. Subject courses were taught with all seminary students together. In addition to professional teacher training, TTS aimed to attenuate regional ethnic tensions by bringing Russian and non-Russian students together for much of their coursework, while simultaneously furnishing them with separate boarding houses, one Christian and another Tatar. The language of instruction was Russian, while Arabic, Persian, and Azerbaijani were employed in the Islamic religion and native language courses. TTS's combined campus, emphasis on pedagogical training and native language offerings differed starkly from the Muslim teacher training schools in Kazan and Simferopol. The Caucasian School of District Trustee and Director Simeonis' vision for the seminary was to maintain a program centered on ped pedagogical practice. So methods for uh, methods components for most subjects, set rubrics for assessment, uh, teaching practicum. And as for the Tatar department specifically, to foster future teachers' ability to teach Azerbaijani and Russian language uh, languages via teaching methods and to develop textbooks and materials at the seminary to support them. Chernayevsky's promotion of the synthetic phonetic method, as opposed to the syllabic method, transformed literacy teaching among Muslims throughout the Russian Empire. The new method, in short time, gave rise to reformed mektebs, often referred to as Suli Jadid schools from Crimea to Central Asia. These have often, most often, been attributed to Ismail Gasparinsky. Even after Semyonov's and later Chernayevsky's tenures, the Tatar department's fundamental framework continued to include native language teaching and retain a focus on pedagogy, even if not as robust as under its initial visionaries. In comparison to other Muslim teacher schools, uh, the school continued to have a more linguistically inclusive curriculum. The incorporation of Azerbaijani Turkic courses, subject courses with methods, uh, with methods components and a clearly defined program for teaching practicum prepared TTS's Muslim graduates to teach primary school among their community's youth. Their seminary experience provided them confidence in public speaking and teaching and leading. And as upperclassmen, they served in positions of measured authority. Classroom teaching gave them a modicum of power as a speaker, an educator, and as a repository of knowledge. Their experience and coursework also provided them usable reference points for navigating the imperial domain. And their teaching certificates were badges of legitimacy. They also had more opportunities for employment than their counterparts in Kazan and Simferopol. So while Simferopol graduates left the profession, taught in other regions, or began to pursue local mektebs reform, many Kazan graduates joined Russian student demonstrations in their city and pursued political activism. TTS graduates, on the other hand, became teachers and members of a critical community that evolved into a cultural reform movement among Azerbaijani Muslims uh, from the 1890s onward. Similar to state administrators' discussions on non-Russian schooling, South Caucasian Muslims debated their own educational concerns on the pages of the empire's first Muslim newspapers. The newspaper editors focused numerous articles on the perceived problems in local Islamic education and set their publications up as civic forums. In general, they understood their papers to be instruments of enlightenment, as well as a space to promote and refine the Azerbaijani language. Printed wholly or largely in the vernacular, as opposed to the region's sacred languages, the newspapers reflected the editor's conscious choice to pursue their native language development as a literary tongue, much to the chagrin of their community's literati. The first newspaper's editor, Hassan Bey Zardabi, expressed his hope that by choosing the vernacular, the newspaper would be accessible to all social strata and may straddle the divide between Shia and Sunni. Collectively, the three newspapers generated new lexicon for conveying ideas about various subjects that emerged within the contemporary languages of the political, natural sciences, technology, health, medicine, government, civil and criminal law, etc. 
The vernacular usage allied with the use of pronouns and adjectives to identify us served to promote a shared ethno-linguistic identity that paired with the editor's continual advancement of cultural reform. In education, illiteracy was at the top of the list of grievances. To address this issue, the editors often looked to TTS's Tata Department for, revolution, for resolution. In 1882, Ziei Kafkasia's publisher, Said Unsezade, uh, shared his impression of the first Tatar Department graduates. The difference between these new young teachers who are patriots, new method graduates, enlighteners, possessors of knowledge and craftsmen, and our tactless, disorderly, ignorant, unskilled school personnel to whom we now have entrusted our dear children is not in clothes and dress, but in skills and in thinking. Four years later, Keshkyu's editor, Jalal Unsezade, juxtaposed his impression of a, con of a conventional Mektab's classroom to his experience at the Tatar department's primary school. Upon entering the new primary school, the oppressiveness and uncleanliness that afflicts our Islamic schools cannot be seen. One cannot find a group of tiny bald children in skull caps covered in dirt sitting on straw mats. One does not see children screaming aloud, Jim, Aleph, Ja, in Arabic letter names, or any other sort of nonsense. Instead, the teacher explains to the students the manner of reading and writing the letters Dal and Fa, the topics of today's lesson. Taking chalk in hand and while addressing the students after the pronunciation of the word death with open and clear voices, the teacher hosts a question answer session among the students that went on in this manner. When I say death, how many sounds do you hear? In what manner are they written? The students stood up to present orally and in writing answers to these questions. Their correct answers indisputably reflect, reflect their mastery of the lesson. As evidenced here, the editors look to recent developments in schooling, including the use, use of the synthetic method, method for reading and writing, pedagogically trained teachers, reformed maktabs and Russian state institutions to resolve their community's ed education is issues. The editors largely supported the new educational order that was beginning to emerge with the state's drive for popular schooling and the establishment of, of Muslim teacher training schools. Consequently, South Caucasian Muslim graduates of the teacher training institutions found state sanctioned legitimacy and support from a growing critical community that embraced them as members and increasingly came to depend upon them for leadership. Baku was the ideal site for the cultural reformers for the cultural reformers in the late 19th century. Due to its oil and manufacturing industries, the city's growth was turbulently fast and uneven. This resulted in a high rate of mobility among the city's residents, varied opportunities for social mobility, and labor-based competition for local resources, which often fell along ethnic lines. All of these contribute to the erosion, contributed to the erosion of the conventional social structure. The atmosphere created spaces for new authorities to advance new value perspectives and move to make structural changes to support them. The combination of an urban center with wealthy Azerbaijani entrepreneurs and a large Azerbaijani Muslim population competing in business and employment provided reformers with financial support and a captive audience. Owing to their experiences and skills obtained at TTS, Tatar department graduates were vital to the reform movement. They joined other members of the critical community, including wealthy magnates, newspapermen, foreign educated elites, and other professionals. Four main institutions, administrative bodies, educational venues, charitable societies, and serial publications created spaces for discourse, support, and propagation of the movement's activities and, ex and experiences in collective organization and act in action. The 1870 municipality statute was implemented in the viceroyalty almost a decade after its ratification. This law was significant for Baku's Muslims. Um, though primarily economic, the law granted them their first opportunity to take part in making administrative decisions for the city. Reformers participated in the new city Duma and voted on the city's budget and allocations to proposed causes. Throughout its existence, Duma members invested in educational programs and institutions that focused on bringing the socio-cultural disparity between Muslim society 
and pressing socioeconomic changes and budding ethnic solidarities uh, that demanded new types of knowledge and skill sets. The Duma contributed funds to support schools establishment, particularly Russo-Tatar schools, as well as student tuitions, Friday schools, and evening courses for laborers and the, laborers and the poor. Duma meetings were a platform for, from which Azerbaijani Muslim reformers could expound on educational reform. For instance, Zardawi used the Duma to advance his views on the virtues, benefits, and necessity of organizing and funding education for laborers and their children, as well as the poor, to the city's most affluent. Zardawi's wife, Hanefe Hanem, recalled his words at a speech during a Duma meeting. Let the city open up more primary, vocational, agricultural schools for the poorest sections of the population, and let the hundreds of thousands required by the city of Teflis for the Polytechnicum be given to those in the Union of Oil Industrialists. After all, their children will study at the Polytechnicum, not the children of Blacksmith Ivan or oil, ba oil baler Abdullah. Zardabi's views found support from those Duma representatives who participated in charitable societies and sponsored the organization of new schools, maintenance, maintenance of existing ones, and scores of scholarships for Azerbaijani Muslim students pursuing secondary and higher education at home and abroad. While certainly fulfilling the Islamic, Islamic obligation of zakat, the wealthy also believed their contributions were an investment in their own and their descendants' future. By investing in education for the greater Muslim society, the wealthy hoped to develop a unified constituency of better skilled workers, loyal consumers, and conscious supporters in the face of other ethnic groups growing economic power. In educational venues, the reform movement's teachers dedicated themselves to teaching Russian and Azerbaijani at a variety of schools and courses in and around Baku. Uh, by 1903, there were nine Russo-Tatar schools and a total of 722 Tatar students. All nine schools had TTS graduates as director, directors, as well as many of the school's teachers were from TTS. TTS graduates also taught in other schools in and around the city, such as the Itihad School, or primary schools located in the oil field suburbs of Bibi Khaybat, Sabunju, and Balakhane, or, or schools or courses financed by the charitable societies Nishri Ma'arif and Nijat. As members of charitable societies, the reformers participated as organizers of theatrical performances, literary evenings, and teachers' conferences that brought together teachers from across the Caucasus. Charitable organizations members likewise worked to publish textbooks and literary works by Muslim authors. The reform movement's members were also active in establishing and working for serial publications. Its members made up the majority of editors, article com contributors, and financiers in Baku's print world. 67 Azerbaijani newspapers had been published in Baku by, by 1918. The vernacular had come to replace the sacred in just over three decades. All these activities concentrated on establishing a sense of shared identity among Azerbaijani Muslims that could supersede sectarian and class divisions. From 1905, the movement grew. Its members dynamically pursued the above mentioned activities and the greater Azerbaijani Muslim community began to partake in educational offerings and serial publications. While an increasing number of parents sent their children to Russo-Tatar schools and reformed mektebs, adult laborers sought out Russian and Azerbaijani courses. These developments evidence the widening support for the reformers' value perspectives. With adversarial conditions empire-wide in the post-1905 period and growing support among the local Muslim community, members of the reform movement began to make political demands for na native language rights and its all Russian Muslim Congress representatives pursued the formation of a political platform for religious and educational autonomy within a constitutional Russian state. The Azerbaijani critical community was a response to colonialism, but it must be recognized as a product of a complex set of changing political rationalities in a colonial project forever under construction. Regions within the Russian Empire with large Muslim populations had different historical experiences and environments, despite existing in the same empire, that created different languages of the political. To grasp the heterogeneity of Islam in Russia and to be able to capture, the, capture its dynamic character, regional studies of less commonly examined areas, 
will provide greater insight into the Muslim colonial experience in Imperial Russia. Thank you to everyone for attending today. I look forward to your questions. Amy, thank you very much. That was a fascinating talk, um, very wide ranging.